Oh, so I'm going to talk about Scala. Um, so on the uh, Scala website, the tagline is optimal and it's functional. So uh, Scala is, um, you know, it runs on the JVM, so I'm going to compare it to Java a lot. But uh, it's, it's more object-oriented than Java. And then uh, it also has a lot of functional language features inspired by languages like Haskell. So if uh, you like object-oriented programming, um, you know, it's, it's very object-oriented, so that's, that's nice. And if you like functional programming, you might like Scala. It's not, not going to be as pure as a uh, pure functional language because of the object-oriented features it has. So, so the language was created by uh, Martin Rodorski. Uh, he's credited with adding generics to Java um, some years ago. Uh, he also has a uh, Coursera course, and one of the better books on Scala is written by him. So, um, I was 10 years old, so it's always amazing to me how long languages can be around before you even hear them sometimes. So it's, uh, it's used by some companies. Um, so I, I work for Intel. So, um, you know, companies like Intel, IBM, Xerox, it's like such big companies, it's not surprising. If, it's surprising if any language isn't used in those companies. It doesn't say a lot to say some big companies using Scala. But um, it's, it's not, it's being used some in the industry, not a whole lot so far. Um, there's this uh, TO programming language popularity index. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. But uh, it tries to estimate language popularity based on uh, jobs and based on um, meetup groups and all kinds of different different things that they go into their index. And so we're, uh, so Scala is actually ranked lower than Ada, COBOL, Fortran. <laughs> so lots of really popular languages are uh, <laughs> ranked higher than it. Um, it is higher than uh, Groovy and Closure, which are the two other big main popular languages that are sort of alternatives to Java and the JVM. Uh, it's a little surprising that it's ranked higher than Groovy and that Groovy and Traction in Scala. So, uh, and if you look at this index, um, there's languages, there's, you'll find more than one language that you've probably never heard of that's more popular than, than this language. So it's, it's, it's down there in popularity. Um, so one cool feature of Scala is it's very compatible with Java. And so if you're in the Java world, it's, very, it's pretty easy to move into Scala. Um, so Scala classes can use Java classes. It just is that they were Scala classes, so it's very uh, it's very easy to have part of your code base in Java and part of it in Scala, and it's very easy to take um, if you've been working in Java land, you know all these libraries, you can use all those same libraries in Scala. Uh, they they translate um, pretty nicely. They won't be as um, Scala like in their some of their interfaces, but um, it's easy to uh, to use them. And the same thing goes the other way. So Scala classes can use Java classes. There's a little restriction. So Scala implements a lot more things in Java. And so if you're adding language features in Scala, or in your interfaces that Java is expected to call, it needs to be things that are compatible with Java so that Java you know, knows how to call it. Um, there's uh, some popular libraries like uh, Akka. It has, um, you know, it has a Scala user base. It's written in Scala. It has a Scala user base, and it also has a Java user base. So there's some of that going on. And then I also think this is nice. Uh, you know, everything you can do in Java, you can do it pretty similarly in Scala. And uh, it's nice because you can transition to a language fairly easy. I might have time for questions, but as a general, I don't know anything about Scala. What is it usually used for? What's like the community do with it? So um, right now, the scalability, like places where scalability really matters, Scala is getting used, and it's also growing uh, in data science. I'm going to talk about a project called Apache Spark that's uh, gaining a lot of traction, and so I think that's going to keep increasing interest in the language. There's also a, like, a web framework that I don't know how popular it is called Play. You might have heard of. So Scala is a statically typed language. 
So just I'm curious how many people are working primarily in statically typed languages versus dynamic type? Not many. <laughs> how many people are working in dynamically typed languages? Uh, so quite a few. So I um, so there's a debate which is better. And, um, the, I'm not gonna. I, I will say I was on the fence, and now I'm struggling on the statically type side. Um, and uh, I don't, there's nice discussions on like stack overflow that you can read. Uh, Actually, there's another question: How many people who use dynamically typed languages like the fact that they're dynamically typed? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so maybe if people use uh, uh, languages, so you'd know even more. Yeah. So they need to be that. Yeah. If you're in the browser, there's not a lot of static like, type options there. Um, so Scala does minimize type-related boilerplate. So if you're programming in Java, it's like you end up with like this a lot. Person, person equals new person, and it gets to be really repetitive. Um, so in Scala. You can say val for value person, and then it can infer the type that it's a person because you just assigned it. So it's kind of obvious what type you intended it to be. Can you do like person person equals new person because like one of the features of Java is you can say like child person equals new person. Yeah. So um, it's, oh, oh nice. <laughs> so, uh, you, you can optionally specify the type, um, but it's not required when you don't. Um, it can be, when it can be inferred, it's inferred, and you can specify type, and you can put this, this is a, the child interface that all people implement or something, yeah. yeah. Can I back to the last screen? I don't know, I was looking at the bottom of the map. So here's a map, and we're saying it's a map of uh, strings, the keys are strings, and the values are string, and then uh, here, you know, we're saying it's a type map, string to string, equals a new map of string to string, so. Um, so one of the things I like about Scala is it minimizes boilerplate in general. Um, so here's a, a class, a real simple class in Java, and one the Scala version. So in, in Scala, we um, left out the word public because classes are public by default. And then we're saying it's class person. It has a property, a val named uh, name of type string, and it has another one of type phone. And then to do the equivalent in Java would be this much code. Um, and so this is a constructor, and then you'll also access this with, um, you have accessors because they're valid. So you can say person.name to get the name. And these are both the, like an immutable version of that. So that's why in, in uh, Java, you have to make it private, you have to say it's final. So here's another example of the same class, except this time we added uh, one more parameter. And so Scala has uh, default values for, uh, for constructors and for methods. And so we're saying the person is living, and we're just saying, oh, default, the default people are living. And so uh, so in, in Java, what you'd have to do is to have, you, you'd end up creating two constructors, one that defaults living to true, and one that lets them specify living to true. And so when it's in Scala, you could just have, implicitly you have two constructors here. You have the two argument one that takes the default value, and you have the three argument one where you can change that default value. So it's nice. And then, good. Is it restricted to the last items? So you can, you can do it. Um, so you could uh, put it first, but then um, you'd have to name the arguments if you wanted to use the default value, or you'd have to... But you can't call with name arguments. Yeah, yeah. And then here's a... Um, so here we've added the word case, and so case classes are... They're just regular classes, except um, the stall compiler adds extra implementation to them. And so... Um, methods that you often have to, maybe, you know, often, but you override in Java, so it's going to automatically write an equals method, and that equals method is going to be a very uh, sensible equals method, like you want to with a, a little class like this. Um, it's going to implement a hash code method. It's going to build a hash code off all these parameters, um, similar to the one you generate, and it's going to do a two-string method. It's going to give a nice string representation of, of a person, 
and it's also going to do this copy method. And it's um, couldn't really write a. Um, it was, it's, it's more advanced than this Java version. There's not really an equivalent in Java of how that method would work. But um, you know, I left out almost all the implementation here. I left all the implementation we had before. I left out the implementation of this method. So this would be about 100 lines in Java, and it's we have three lines in Scala. So um, this is this is nice for those sort of basic domain objects that you might be have passing around your system. And then here's a mutable version. So, so far, that's been immutable. Now, this is a mutable version of the same class. And instead of val, we're saying var, we're saying var here. And so in Java, we have setters. And so in Scala, you could say like person.name equals the value you want to assign. So the, there's a, a setter, but it's um, use the equals method to set. And then, um, so I did a project at my company. I, um, did, uh, we had about 10,000 lines of code in a module, and I rewrote it into Scala. And um, it's not a one, it wasn't a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, in the Scala, we added more functionality, we dropped some functionality. Um, Scala had 100% unit test coverage. The Java module had kind of low coverage, um, but in that example, it was a 40% of the lines of code, so it was like 4,000 lines versus 10,000, and. Um, and then I read that people say it's about half the length of code, so that was about right with my experience with it. So it's, yeah, it adds up a lot, you know, like you're of a, you know, one of my friends at work, you know, he says that you only have so many keystrokes in your hand, so if you want to keep doing this a long time, it's going to be typing less. Any questions at this point? Yeah, I have a question. So, another, so I'm trying to, I'm going to, I'm going to more with the basics of Scala. Um, so my, the first Scala talk I went to, my eyes started glazing over like 10 minutes into it, and by the end my head was about to explode because there was so, so much information to take in, so I'm trying to just show little things that um, get you maybe interested in the language. So um, Scala encourages immutability, and uh, we have fans of immutability. A few people, okay. Um, so in Scala, if you declare something val, you can't you can't reassign it. So you get a compile error if you try to reassign the value. So in Java, the, the thing you do to do that is you declare it final. Um, and so Java can do this too. Um, but what's convenient is val is a lot more convenient than having to write final all over the place. Um, and we've done a team with like 15 programmers doing Java. And we had one guy on the team that everything was final. And so we could tell this constant from anybody else's. So it was kind of it's like it's like kind of the technically the right thing to do, but then also because it's it's like, oh there's it's more documented what it's doing, it's more obvious that you can't reassign these things, but also it's like a mess to look at because it's it's so littered with file. So I, I like I like that a lot more. Um, and then bar, if you need mutability, you can use bar. And it's just as convenient to be immutable as, as mutable. So another example is the collections. So in Scott, in that class definition, you use val. Uh -huh. And in parentheses, can you use var as well? Yeah, so you could use var or yeah. val. Create getters and setters. Oh, yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah. So you can if it's if it's vars, you can reassign them, and if they're vals, then they're they're constants. Um, so. The collections in Scala are, are pretty rich, um, and they're they're all immutable by default. But there's also mutable versions of all the same collections. So you can, if you want to use the mutable ones, you have to import them uh, explicitly. But the immutable ones are the ones you get by default. So it's kind of pushing you towards immutability. Uh, in Java, all the standard collections are mutable. And there's you can have immutable ones in Java too, but people don't. Um, it's uncommon that they're actually. Use most things I don't. So here's another example. So um, method parameters. So we have a method here. It's uh, you say def the method name. This is an argument name. This is the argument type. This is the return type. And then equals. And here's the body of the method. Um, so you can't reassign method parameters. So it's like a, a good clean code readability practice in general, not to reassign method parameters. Um, 
in Scala, it's, it's illegal. So in Java, you can make it into illegal if you use the word final. But once again, you know, final, 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 it's good to get uh, tiresome. So uh, Scala is object oriented, so still compared to Java. So um, in Scala, there's no primitives. So um, in Java, you have primitives. Classes in Scala are the same as Java classes. Scala has another concept called objects. So um, these are like classes that are singletons. Um, and there's no equivalent in Java. They, they're kind of equivalent as static methods and fields on classes in Java. Um, and then abstract classes are about the same. Um, and then Java has interfaces. Scala has traits. So traits, they can be like interfaces. So you can have a trait that has no implementation and it's just like a Java interface. But you can also add implementation to traits. Um, and there's no equivalent for that in Java. So this is uh, really unclear. So in so to be completely compatible with Java, right? Java has objects and it has primitive values. And so to get those to, to be compatible and still have to be able to support that, what Scala did is they extended the object hierarchy basically. And so all Java objects are down here, and they extend a class and then a prop, they put a class called any. And then and that allowed them to have values, which are like kind of primitive wrappers also under any, so you can be compatible with Java primitives even though you don't implement them as primitives in your stuff. But they also had to extend down in the language um, for, for uh, null and nothing to be able to, to put it um, So here's another class. So we have the person class with two, two properties and it has a method of, of reading it returns a string, and then it's saying return the, the you know, say hello with the person's name. And here's the next version of that class. So that return type was unnecessary. You can infer the return type because it's returning a string. The, uh, the curly braces you can drop because you don't have to have the curly braces. They're, they're optional for uh, like a one-line method. And then return is optional because um, the last statement in the method is the return value. So, um, so this reading method can get a lot shorter. And if, if this is like a public method, you would still put, you know, colon string, so you'd have the return type. Especially if it was a long method, you'd want return types even though you're not required to use them, just to make it become more readable. But um, you can go this short if you want to. And here's another example of the same class. So greeting is just evaluating a string each time. And so rather than evaluating it each time, we could, we could say this is lazy, so it only gets evaluated when you call it. We can call it, we can turn it into a val so that once it gets evaluated, it's only evaluated once. And, and this method can be called the same. You know, it's not a method, it's a value, but it can be called the same as a method. You, could, you can go more complicated where this could be a uh, all block of code doing initialization that is a part of value that's not going to change. So this is another version of the same class. So in Scala, there's your constructor arguments are on the class definition. So the body of the class is is like part of the constructor. And so here we're saying require name not be null, phone not be null. And so require is like a language construct that just says if this isn't true, throw an exception. Um, and then we have our, our method greeting again. And then we have another method called say hello. And this one has parens, and this one doesn't have parens. And so there's a convention where you, um, so a method can have parens or not. So for accessors, you typically don't have a uh, parens. For something that has more of a side effect or it's doing more work, then you have parens, so it sort of documents that, oh, this is just an accessor. And this is how you can, uh, uh, so you have, you know, that name, you're, you're saying person.name. If you want to change that implementation, you can because your method doesn't have to have parens. That makes sense. 
So in say hello is like everything has a return type. So this return type here is called unit. And unit just means void. It's like there's no, no return. Uh, but you have to return something, so they so you're returning unit. And, uh, and print line is like this is not that out, then print line. You can have multiple returns, you can explicitly return just like you could in Java. Can you return multiple objects, like multiple results? Yeah, so uh, Scala has uh, tuples, so you can return a pair. You can return two things in a, in a tuple, um, or you know, however different sizes. So the traits, um, they're similar to Java interfaces, except they have implementation. And these are not like uh, mixins in other languages that they might use in JavaScript. Um, and they support multiple inheritance. And uh, multiple inheritance has, uh, um, has challenges, how Scala, Scala solves them by, it's something called linearization. So they, there's an explicit order in which <coughs> things are called if you are mixing in a lot of classes together. There's a specific order of, you know, that this trait is and its, its parent, and then this, this, you know, I don't, I don't even know the, the rules yet. I haven't been doing anything with that complicated of an um, So you define a trait, and so we're saying this is an integral trait with an abstract type. And so something, so this is just like an interface. So here's an example where we have two traits and a, a class person that is, um, gets the traits mixed in. And these traits have implementation, so they can have a variable, they can have a method, variable method, and then you can call those things on the person class or within the person class as if it was part of the class. So one place where traits really shine is in the, the Scala collections library. Um, because it's easy to mix in these traits, it can create really rich uh, interfaces for methods. Because instead of having to write um, write all the implementations of each of those methods for each class, you can mix it in to all the classes that that implementations are um, valid for, like uh, append or um, uh, convert it to some other type or uh, things like that. Does it matter if you extend callable with logging or if you extend logging with callable? So in this example, it wouldn't matter. The first trait you're mixing in needs to be needs to be extends, and then afterwards everything's with. It's kind of like a comma. Oh. It's kind of just like a and is the extends yes yeah. and extends with is the extends. There's no difference between the two. So there there is a difference because of that linearization process. So there's going to be a difference if we started having things that were common, which method is going to get called, that's going to influence that. But otherwise, yeah. Oh, well, I have less credit, but, uh, and traits can extend other traits, it's or? Traits can extend other traits, and then classes can extend traits, and classes can extend oh, yeah. abstract <laughs> classes, yeah. and they can have traits and extend. Cool. So pattern matching is, is um, Okay. Sorry. So what can so the difference in can you instantiate a trait? So is that like the major difference in a class and a trait then? So you, if you could you can instantiate a trait if you give it an implementation. So like in this example, there's already um, so string is uh, this phone number is abstract, so you can't uh, you can't if it had a value, then you could you have to give it a body. So your body could be empty if everything wasn't abstract. Your body could be empty, and then you could instantiate it like a class because you've given it enough to be a class, just an empty body. In this example, you'd have to uh, give phone a value to, to instantiate it. So um, pattern matching. So pattern matching is like uh, the case statement in Java, um, kind of on steroids. So here we have def for our method, the method name, the uh, one argument, which is a value, which can be of any type, and it's going to return a string, and then the body of the method is 
value match, and then we have cases. And so here we have you know, an integer, we're matching on Boolean, we're matching on a string, on classes. Um, <coughs> and so in, in Java land, you would be, you'd, you'd have a giant if else block that was like if instance of this, and it would be kind of complicated to write. Um, and then the pattern matching goes a lot further, where you can do sort of deep pattern matching in objects. And, Pretty advanced. So here's another example. So you can the case classes you can just use them in, independently just to get the nice two string and equals and things like that. But you can also use them for the, the pattern matching. So we have an abstract uh, person class, and then we have an employee and a customer, and then we have a method that matches employee with customer and does different logic depending on the implementation of you know or what kind of Person, person is. Um, so, I mean, back to the brief syntax too. You can define your three classes like that in one file, and you know, it's pretty pretty. Cool. So, any questions actually? So, when you go, is it? Do you have to overwrite all of the properties for a class you uh, inherit from? Um, no, so if um, so, you don't have to override a name. You could, but you have to you have to supply that parameter if it's like a value. You have to supply it to this. This is like the parents constructor. You have to supply it somehow. So you could um, uh, you could do some limited things there. Like if you had a full name, you could maybe you might be able to break it apart. I think. Yeah, okay. Sorry. So the other question is. So the matcher there, like in a lot of languages, that would be sort of a, like you would never get a customer because customer parents are just employee. Or uh, no, it doesn't. Sorry. So I mean, if, if you had one that was like person, uh -huh. would it throw an error if it was first? Because like you would never get to like if the first case was like case p person. Yeah. So I think you can get. Um you get an error. I'm not sure. Like I, think, I think you're going to get the compiler warnings. I don't know that you're going to get an error. Um, there's another concept they call a, like sealed, where you can you can say, oh, these are the only ones I'm ever going to support, and you can say, and I want to make sure my match statement matches all the possibilities. Um, I don't know the syntax so I'll tell that. So I'm confused about the equals that as it's defining where the function body starts. Is that that is. Equals where? The double equals person match. Awesome. That just means it's so, so, so this is saying, so this is, yeah, so you have a method name and then the parameter, the return type, uh -huh. and then we're saying equals, this is the method body. Yeah, that's, that's where the body And then the person, body person is matching, so matches like a switch or something, and then here's the cases that you can match that person against. So you don't ever open the function body with a specific. You so, so, so we, so we, could, we, could, we could put uh, a curly bracket right here, and a curly bracket down okay. here, and that would be valid syntax too. And you know, so it's uh, it's it's your choice, I guess. Yeah. Is there any forced indentation or semicolons in here? Or so there's there's uh, no semicolons. So that's another nice thing. You can't add semicolons. Um, so if you want to have two statements on the same line, you're going to have to have a semicolon. Um, and then, Scott, it's like the compiler is pretty smart at figuring out where you intended to break things. So um, a lot of times, so if you there's like there's rules about it. So if you're uh, concatenating a bunch of things, you want to end with a plus on the end of the line. And then continue on the next line, and then the compiler is going to see that plus and say, "Oh, well, it just needs something." It will come to the next line and see if it's there. So it's uh, it's pretty clever because uh, to get rid of semicolons is nice, and it's not it's not like Python where it's enforcing, you know, it's all inferred from indentation or something. It's, uh, it's, uh, so person in this case is on the left hand of match. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so this, this parameter is is um, being passed here, right. and it's and it, you're, it is the right, parameter to match. It's, right? it's the thing to match. Yeah. Is that like a common pattern that you have parameters on the left of things, or is that just for an operator? 
Because normally they're already doing like match parentheses person. Yeah. Person dot match or something. So, yeah, that's confusing me to have this. Yeah. I don't know if it's common. Um, yeah, it is a little odd when you bring it up. Um, but it's kind of like a match is kind of like, like if or for or something. It's kind of part of language. So. Um, yeah. I, I was just wondering if there was some general pattern like take this object and apply it to this, or apply the right thing to the left leg. Not sure. I, I can't. I can't think of like a. Or I'm seeing it in my head. Like, oh yeah, that's true or not. So, another language feature is called implicit conversions. So, um, so we have a, a person class, and then this is a, a singleton. So we're calling it an object. So it's a singleton greeter, and it has a method called greet, and it takes that person object and it's going to print uh, hello that person's name. And then, um, so then we say greeter greet President Obama. This is a compiled error because this is a string, and this guy expected a person. So since and that compiled error, like you know, happens, and then the compiler is going to look for an implicit conversion that says, you know, convert um, or to like a, a string into a person. So you can have, in your scope, you can define implicit conversions for converting types. Um, would that be in the reader or in the person? So this would be a, uh, a, like a def that's in scope of, of, of this line of code. So, so, so it doesn't so have to be defined in the person class. Yeah, so you, you could have this in another file, and then you could import it at the top of wherever you're doing this. So you can import it in the line before and say, oh, Include this, this conversion. So this is kind of nice. Um, if you're working a lot with person objects, and a lot of times they just have a name, or you're in test code, and you need to set up lots of boilerplate kinds of objects, then implicit conversions can be kind of a shortcut way to help you to do that. It's, it's kind of evil because it's um, it's like not obvious that. Uh, like, how did this? How did it understand this? Where's Where's the Greek method that takes a string? I don't understand. So it's it's not obvious. Is that is that permanent? Was that like block level, or what's that? You said you you would use the implicit when you were going to do the greeting, and not at the definition of the person. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you can do the implicit. So the conversion. So this method here could be inside a class, and it could be inside a nested in a block, and you could import that conversion just into that yeah, little so block. The implicit thing would just be block level. Yeah. Or so you, could implicit, you could code. import it into the whole class, right? You can import into the whole, uh, let's sell a file, and it's in, in, in effect for that whole file. So, so what is scope? So, what do you have on the screen right now? Like, uh -huh. is this, like, does everything have to be in a class like Java? Um, so, or, like, I mean, is this a valid file? So, this is not a valid file. Like, uh, this guy, would, this, this would need to be in something. Um, it's there is like a REPL, so it's it's not, but it, that's kind of creating scope. Like scope. It's kind of creating scope for stuff that things are in. Um, so it's like it's like Java, except a lot more flexible. So you can have things to find in more places than Java. So um, can you, you can define methods inside another method. There's and can you have a scope with a class? Um, scope with a class. So I, I think internally, I think there's going to be, um, well, like the global scope. So you can, you can, there's like package scope, so you can put things inside packages. Okay. And if you're at a REPL, it'll feel like there is no scope, but you know the REPL is doing something fancy behind the scenes that is, is maybe like a class scope. Ten minutes. Okay. So, um, so when Cool thing with implicit conversions is you can use them to enrich APIs. So here we do another one, and we're gonna let's say person is something we don't control; it's some uh, someone else's class, but we want to have a convenient to JSON method on it. So we want to be able to say you know here person and say to JSON turn it into JSON, um, but that method doesn't exist in person. We can't add it because it's someone else's source code. We can we can define like an enriched wrapper that will get created and let us call that method on that class. So this is this is pretty cool because you could 
And Scala does this with uh, the Java libraries, uh, all the, the base stuff. You can include Java conversions in your file, and then you can get Scala methods on, on string and hash, hash map and all the familiar Java classes. You get new methods. Um, so it's kind of like auto boxing in Java. So, oh, so that last one then replace the constructor for person with the new JSON person. No, so it, when the compiler hit this, it says there's no two JSON method. So let me see if I can resolve that via an implicit conversion. And so it, it right then it says, okay, let's change this to an uh, so enriched person. It looked for a class that had a two JSON method that it could take a person and apply it to. Yeah, so okay. here's the ones for person, it's going to look them all up, all the conversions, and then it's going to try and find one that, that can add that method. That's so, and then one of the areas Stella shines is PSLs. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, both, uh, it's both awesome about Scala and not so awesome because uh, a lot of the libraries, they People write DSLs, and a DSL can make your life easier because it can provide kind of a new language that's simplified for the task at hand. But also, you don't want to have to learn that language just to accomplish something small because it's not worth the overhead of the language. Um, so there's a lot of features that help do that. Implicit convergence is one. So here's a, an example, like a periods and friends are sometimes optional. So here we have reader. We can drop that period for the method, and this is just a method because it came afterwards. We can drop the parens, because um, the parens are optional when there's only one argument. And then we have an implicit conversion that took that string, and you can start to write things. You know, you wouldn't write this in your main code necessarily, but there might be cases where you, you know, writing in this more English style could, uh, could be helpful. Match works, right? What's that? I mean, that sort of match was defined with reader, unlike any object. Then that would work with that syntax, right? Um, I'm not sure if I understand. Well, like in that syntax right there, right? I was basically sending, calling greet on greeter, but you could also think of it as sending greeter to a greet. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think it makes sense, so, so I just wonder stylistically, how minimal do things get? I mean, you use people, but is it considered better form to just get it as terse as possible? So it depends on the team. So if you're, you know, your team, if you're writing in consistent style, I mean, this is probably the better format in general, right? It's just the full format. And then if you have some special need, where it is, you know, so it can skip ahead to, um, so here's um, like a there's a library called Scala Test, and it's for behavior-driven development, right? And so you create like a specification. You say a person should have a name, and so this is like a kind of nice DSL, right? So you write your test more like a spec of how the thing is supposed to behave, and so um, that's maybe a case where it's like nice that some of these rules are flexible because you can. You know, write a test code that is maybe more understandable. Um, but you probably don't write code like that everywhere. So, let's sign me up. Five minutes? Five and a half. Okay. So, we're talking about a couple of just functional language features. So, here we're creating a list of integers, and then we're calling map on that list. And map is going to apply a function to every element of that list and return a new list. And so we're saying uh, for each element x, um, this is our, our lambda, multiply that element by 2. And so then we have a list of doubled values. And then um, they doubled for each element of that list, print line, and we print out the list. So it's, 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 you know, there's a lot of languages that do this. It's not uh, nice though. And um, it's for kind of a long time, I want to skip a little bit. So, so here's another example. We have our double list, 
And then you could also say, well, on that list, I want to reduce that list down to a single value. And then you have a, a method that's going to take two elements and it's going to add them together, give one element, right? And so reduce is going to add a total of all the elements in that list. And so then we print the total, and then the total is 20. So this is what MapReduce is in the simplest sense. And if you think about like a Apache to do, they're going to MapReduce, this is what they're doing. They're converting something, and then you know, doing something or something, and then reducing it down to I just I feel myself tensing up because of the ambiguity. Like the case word was used for two different things, and for the case and then the case of the class, and the spaces were used for two different things. It could either be a method call or a parameter. Yeah. And then here parentheses are used for different things. Sometimes it's a function body, and sometimes it's yeah. parameters. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, yeah, it's a little, it's, it's a little. There's other characters. It's a, it's a bit much to take in. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, the, the main criticism of the language is scholars always complicated. It's, it's just, just ambiguous. ambiguous. With reduce, it's ambiguous as to like what reduce is doing. Like, generally, if you reduce caller, you don't start on. Or you would reduce all the values, but there's one, what is x or y or something no. So and this is only one value list. This is taking two values, and it's reducing two values into one, and then it's taking that value plus the next value, we're just going to get down the line. So what, yeah. what if there was only one item in the list? Then, um, I don't know. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is It'd the zero accumulator? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, what's the accumulator? Like, like, it seems like there's an implicit so, accumulator of zero somewhere. So is, is X or Y the accumulator? I'm just curious. Like if you had something that wasn't commutative there. I, I, I'm not sure which one's the key. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Huh. Yeah. So, um, so Spark is a new project that's pretty interesting. So it uh, became top of Apache in February. And then last month, version 1.0 was released. And it's uh, written in Scala. And um, it's a... Uh, kind of a competitor to Apache Hadoop. And it's a lot faster, and so it's got a lot of people excited. And, um, and so I have one more example here. So in Spark is, we're saying from Spark, load a text file in HDFS. HDFS is the Hadoop file system. So this could be a text file that's 200 gigs, and it's stored over uh, four machines. And it's going to load that into something called an RDD, which is kind of like a big list. Right? And then on that list, we can call map, the RDD we can call map, which is very much like the Scala map. And each line of that file, we're going to convert it to an int and then multiply it by two. And then we're going to have a doubled, it's, they call it RDD, um, it's like a giant list distributed across four machines. And then we're going to save that as a text file. So what's, this is something cool with Scala. It's like that real simple example we did with a, a list with five elements. You could do it with a, a 200 gigabyte list on a cluster of machines, with each with 32 cores, multiplying by two. And that's not very interesting for multiplying by two, but it does get interesting for like, people are using it for machine learning, right? Some more complicated algorithm that they're going over that data a bunch of times, trying to uh, find patterns in it. So Spark is, is pretty interesting. Um, and then Spark has a lot more stuff. So it has a um, map reduce group by. So you can, it's like almost like giant tables you can have in memory and you can be doing manipulations with them. So um, then it has like machine learning out of them to do it and graph. So this is a project that's bringing a lot more attention to Scala right now, I think. So uh, it also shows something about the language and that they were able to implement this. Um, and this is like, the project is it's like 100,000 lines of code. It's like not that big. And then you would get uh, like Hadoop or something that's maybe like 400,000 lines. So, uh, so this is something bringing more attention to uh, Scala. It's <laughs> <laughs> complicated. Um, you can adopt a subset of the language, right? You can say, well, don't, don't you, the, met, the dot is not required for making a method call, but you put dot there, because everyone on the team needs to be able to code quickly and understand it. 
you don't, you know, other libraries, they all have like DSLs. You don't want to just adopt every library that each has its own DSL. That you have to spend two days learning to get this much functionality out of. Um, and uh, it's, it is powerful, though, and concise. And that's it. You know, this is an unplugged bit, um, um, so we're, we're hiring, so we're doing uh, product development, big data, graph analytics, we're doing a lot of good stuff. We're looking for especially like senior job engineers. Who, who's hiring? It's uh, Intel. Very good. Yeah.